Hello and welcome to the very first episode of the Care to Learn podcast. Each month we will sit down with interesting and influential professionals working within healthcare and education and talk about what makes training programs actually work. My name is Wayne Woff, coming to you from Ausmed Education, and I'll be your tour guide over the ensuing weeks and months. We're enormously excited to welcome our first guest to the Care to Learn podcast, Cynthia Wellings, who is the founder and CEO of Ausmed Education. Founded in 1987 as a publishing company, Today, Osmed is Australia's leading provider of CPD education for health professionals and the home of the award-winning CPD app. In today's discussion, we'll touch on planning, evaluation, and most importantly, translation to practice. And Cynthia will share some tips on how to ensure your education actually works. So let's get into it. Well, it's terrific to welcome our CEO, Cynthia Wellings. Welcome to you, Cynthia. Thank you. We'd like to kick off today in our podcast with maybe you just giving us a little bit of your professional and business background for the for the listeners. I think it would be a terrific way to kick off. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm a, I started as a nurse, did my original work in the London Hospital in, in, in London, of course, and then came to Australia and did a whole raft of things. I got very interested in incontinence <laughs> and, um, and was one of the founding members of the Australian Continence Foundation way back uh, in the day. And of course, that's an important organisation now. Yeah, so over the years, I've always been passionately uh, fond of nursing because I fundamentally believe it is the professionalisation of compassion. And I think it's very important to our community that we have that. So my background, well, I was awarded the um, one of uh, one of Australia's hundred women of influence several years ago, and um, I've done courses at Yale and at Harvard in business. So I've sort of mixed nursing and business together all the way through my career. And recently, I completed a master's of nursing in nursing leadership. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy with the with the uh, with, with where I'm at now and. Of course, all through this, I've woven work in Osmed, which has been a great journey. And that journey with Osmed started back in 1988? Uh, 87, yeah. So it's a long while. We started um, when I wrote a book with a doctor and we sent it off to the Northern Hemisphere. The book was on urinary incontinence. We sent it off to publishers in the Northern Hemisphere and we just never heard back. And so we self-published and uh, that started off the little publishing company, which in those days was called AECD Publishing. And I started to realise that I was working with a lot of very talented nurses and none of them ever got were ever able to get published in, in books. It was almost impossible because there was really no outlet down here. There was one small company at the time, and but it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a... Um, it wasn't easy, and so I started to publish some of my colleagues. At the time, I was working at Royal District Nursing Service, and um, there were some really talented people there. Um, and so, yeah, over the years, we changed from a publishing company to a nurse education company, and in fact, we published our last paper book uh, several years ago, which was on palliative care. It was the third edition, and that was a wonderful book. So, yeah, we've done some really... Um, throughout Throughout the journey of the company, it's been... Um, you know, it's been very interesting and very adaptive. Mm. And that journey has taken you through conferences and seminars and now more to yeah. a, a tech-based company in part. Yeah, I think um, uh, the, the secret now to to survival is to be highly adaptive. Yeah, it's actually been being able to flex and adapt, but also um, to understand that that as the disruptions that occur in society happen you have to build an organization that that can't control for all risk but that can actually be adaptive so that when when events occur you can actually adapt very quickly to 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 um, minimize the impact of those um, always for in the best interests of people yeah okay the other thing we'd like to do now is just start off with some almost warm-up questions in terms of the space that we want to talk about, healthcare mm-hmm. and education. Mm-hmm. The first one of those, do you prefer doing online or face-to-face learning? 
I, I think that's an incredibly interesting question. And the reason I think that is because the I think our brains work very differently depending on the medium. So, for instance, if you're reading something, it is probable that there's a, um, a brain network that is very different if you're listening to something. And if you're listening and looking, then probably different parts of the brain are activated as well. So I don't think you can compare one or the other. I think there's a place for all types of learning. And I don't actually think that, that any one size fits every person all the time. And I think probably the best CPD is a mix. And across your extensive and very diverse career, what's the best advice you've ever received about CPD learning? Well, I used to think it was it, it was to find out as much as you can, as fast as you can. And I've actually changed that now because I think it's no longer possible for a human brain to be a repository of fact. There is just so much facts, uh, so much new knowledge, new information coming out all the while that at some stage you just have to acknowledge that that, that has to be held in a different in a different medium and probably um, the, the days of the, the brain being that of a good memory um, alone, um, the people with the best memories having the, the, the best jobs, I think is, is changing. And my, my feeling now is it's all about intellectual sharpening and that the future of education is going to be in trying to encourage people to think really well and know how to, to actually use facts and find facts and be very aware of what they don't know. The future is for the people who ask the best questions. Once you know what question you're asking, you can find the answers. It's, the answers are everywhere, but it's actually formulating what you want to know and sharpening up on that. Terrific. I think that's a great insight for our listeners. Mm. Now we'll drill down a little bit more specifically in the next part of our um, CPD Matters um, podcast today to look at an organisational perspective. So from that perspective, could you give the listeners an overview, I suppose, and that's all the time mm. will allow today, what does a great education and training plan look like? Yeah, I, look, I think that's a really interesting question because at the end of the day, the quest, it probably should, we should probably be asking, does it work? What does it mean for the, the, the person who's receiving the results of that education? It, it, it is one thing to put knowledge, as I say, into someone's head, but if it resides in the head with no meaning and, it, and then it's just dying, the cells are dying and the education is just desiccating, then what value is that? So the real, I think the next frontier is what, what works? How can you provide education that resonates so that within minutes or the next day or the next hour um, it, it can actually be effectively used and I think that is that is for us the real challenge and that's certainly what we're crack, we're trying to crack because you know there's lots and lots of reporting that's possible saying oh we you know we provided all this education well so what if it didn't work what's the point and so I think we really need to turn this, to flip this on its on its head and say, well, you know, the person, we're looking at the outcomes for patients or, or, or women in midwifery units, wherever it is, and saying, or families or where, you know, in addiction centres and saying, how are we making a difference and how is that linking to um, the, the upregulation of knowledge within the organisation? So do you think, just picking up on a couple of the points that you'd made there, do you think it's fair to say that people at times play the volume game too much? The more that yeah. I get out there, the more that I ask people to do, the more that I give people, yeah. the more events they go to, automatically they believe will yeah. lead to better outcomes. Yeah, I, I think I think feeding people, if I, if I can actually say vomiting, vomiting education onto people, you know, it's finished that kind of thing is just doesn't work. I think what, what works is where you actually stimulate people to have voice. Um, you stimulate think people to, to challenge, to think about, well, so what, why am I, how, how does that work? And certainly the research we conducted last year where, where we looked at, um, we actually analysed a thousand uh, evaluation forms from our seminars and we asked three main questions 
What changes, what one change would you make as a result of what you've learned? Second question, um, how will your patients benefit from what you've learned? And the third question, what barriers do you perceive would um, prevent you putting into practice what you've learned? And it was just extraordinary because there was just so many similarities in the answers, even though the thousand seminar um, evaluations we looked at Re reflected seminars that had occurred in Perth, in Brisbane, in Melbourne, in Sydney. They were um, from seminars relating to palliative care, from feet, uh, from neonatal um, programs, from um, leadership programs. So they're right across the board. But the kind of issues that were that were raised were were were, were reasonably similar. But one thing that did come through in the how will your patients benefit was this enormous sense of I really care for my pa I really want the best for my patient it was one of the most spiritually lifting um, uh, research things you could have done to be honest but the barriers if I can just focus on that they were quite consistent and one was put one was was time time was a big barrier nurses definitely perceived and midwives perceived time is a big barrier to putting into place new knowledge. Another barrier that came up a lot was pushback from other staff. And in, in other words, the, the inference there, in my opinion, was if I know about a new way of being, but I go back to an environment, so I've, I've moved myself out of the environment, I've learned a new way of, of, of doing something or a new way of practising, I go back to my environment where no one else has been exposed to this, it is so difficult for me to then put that in play because the, the pushback will be hard because the others don't know about it. So that was a, a really big concern. There were others, but we really looked into this and this is now where we're working on to try to um, provide education in Osmed that actually can cut through some of this, um, this stuff and be effective because unless it's effective, what's the point? Yeah. So just... Teasing that out a fraction further for our listeners in terms of the evaluation conversation, in terms of the translation yeah. and the improvement of practice to the benefit yeah. of the client, of the yeah. patient, it would be fair to say that you're a great believer that the quality and depth of that evaluation and the analysis of the benefit of yeah. education is hugely important. Yeah, well, I, I, I think one of the interesting things that we discovered was that the evaluation tool should not just be the, well, what did you learn? So, you know, at the end of the day, unless what you learned can be used, then so what? That's the so what factor. What, we, what we've been doing and playing around with in our, in our evaluation tools is asking people to envision what will change as a result of what, they're, what they've learned. So we think that by envisioning and planning in their mind how it would look, that actually is extending into the future. The difficulty that Osmed has is that we can evaluate at point of closure of the event or a few months later or something else, but it's all self-reporting. We can't actually see what changed as a result downstream in the work environment out in Patchy Wallach or wherever it is. And so we can only go on what people report. And that's a real weakness for us, but that would not be a weakness for a, for a facility where it's much more measurable. But I do think that, and in fact, certainly I think the um, the work that Bernadette Melnick's doing on, on evidence, the translation of um, evidence-based practice in the University of Ohio, what they're suggesting is that the, or what they're finding is that the use of mentoring. So you give the, you know, you, you, you give new knowledge and then you have a mentor to help translate and build confidence. Confidence is a huge issue in terms of changing practice. Um, and that certainly came out in our research as well. So it would be fair to conclude our discussion here on evaluation and translation into practice by saying that particularly at an organisational level, people must ensure that that evaluation process isn't seen as the end point. Yeah, but there's a, there's a logical extension of yeah. the evaluation findings that must be acted upon. Yeah. Otherwise, it yeah. will be yeah. so bloody what? Yeah, so bloody what? I mean, I think, I think that's a really good point, Wayne, because if you, if you are going to invest in ongoing education then it needs to work. It is such a costly thing. You've got type people off wards, you know, off units. You've, you're, you're paying for the quality of the education. And if it makes no difference at the end of the day, 
then there is no point in doing it. So the evaluation is, is a critical thing and it's not just a report on, you know, on this many people turned up to this much, which I'm sure it's not anyway, but in our experience, it's a wonderful way to assist in the translation of knowledge into practice um, simply by um, changing the mindset of the person at the end and the expectation of the person at the end. But then, as I say, that's the beginning of the journey, the next part of the journey. It's like a handball into the organisation and saying, how are you going to open up a vortex to suck this knowledge through so that it can be practised and you can you can upregulate the, the, the standard of care that you're providing and be able to demonstrate um, that, it's, that it's effective. Okay, we'll conclude our podcast today with a, a final few quick questions. Uh, the first one, probably I already have a pretty good insight given the discussion that we've just had. What's the one question you would always ask on an evaluation form or process, whether it be online, whether it be in writing? What's the one yeah. question you would always ask? I think the really critical question is, so what? So what? You know, it's all well and good list, you know, list three medicines that interact with warfarin. You know, uh, so what? You know, what's going to change as a result of what you what you now know? If you've established a need, there's a need for this education. We're closing this gap by providing this education. At the end of the education, how are you going to close that gap? How are you now going to actually ensure and how are you going to measure that that gap was closed? And was it closed? You know, is it is is education enough to close that gap? Probably not. In many cases, education may not even be the answer. It may be that the policies and procedures have got to change or, or that the, um, the system has got to have better resources for the provision of this or there's not enough sufficiently um, educated staff on board to actually provide the, the comprehensive care that's required. And education per se is never going to close that gap. So it's really understanding what, what the nature of the gap is in the first place and then evaluating to see whether you really did close it. But I caution here because our research has also shown that if you just focus on needs and you just focus on closing gaps, you're missing out on the broad perspective of discretionary education, which actually can really elevate levels of emotional intelligence probably or, or the richness of, of the provision of care that you can miss out on. Uh, and I'll give you an example. So if you're in aged care, you can say, well, OK, in aged care, we're going to give education on falls, we're going to give education on dementia, we're going to give education on, on um, you know, medicines, uh, correct use of medicines in aged care, etc. But what about PTSD? You know, that may not seem like a, 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 an educational imperative in aged care, but it may well be absolutely critical to a great many of the people, actually, who are in there. So I think the discretionary education is really what makes the difference in that quality factor. So if you're just focusing on mandatory education, I do think you're going down a very, very uh, dark tunnel of reductionist thinking. Mm. So I think we can take from <laughs> Cynthia's answer there that the evaluation form that focuses on the chairs, the coffee, whether you like the speaker or not, <laughs> might have a little bit less value mm. than previously it had. Mm. The second one I think will be of interest, of great interest to a lot of our listeners. What's your top tip for engaging reluctant learners? Yeah, a, a lot, that's a really interesting question. I believe everyone is inherently curious. I, I just think that the one size fits all is not necessarily the answer. And certainly the idea is to, to, to try and get underneath and to find out what is the motivational buttons. And it is, there is not one. It's complex. People are becoming more and more complex now. And they have so much choice and so much distraction. And so I think you have to, you have to do it well. You've got to do it slow. And you've got to do it rigorously. But the payback downstream, in my opinion, is, is self-evident. Yeah. And I think that also reinforces in a healthcare environment and a nursing environment the need to personalise, whether that be with our clients, yeah. whether that be with our staff. We, yeah. we don't address those mm. issues, I think, at our peril. Yeah. Final couple of questions. What's your favourite personal learning tip? Favourite personal I think, learning tip? I think slow and steady. I think day by day, brick by brick. I mean, I personally spend at least an hour a day, at least an hour a day on learning new, new, um, new things. I, I am intently curious. 
I think, ladies and gentlemen, our listeners out there, it's a perfect point to which conclude this first edition with that thought about curiosity, about lifelong learning. And we thank Cynthia for her great discussion today, her great insights. We hope you enjoyed this enormously and we look forward to edition two coming up soon. Thank you.